Musa as our first guest. He is from Ledger Prime. He's an epic OTC trader. <laughs> Super excited <laughs> to have him on. So Ben, if you uh, just want to give us a brief background of where you work, what do you do, how old you are. Sure, yeah, I'll dox myself. Yeah, uh, <laughs> so I'm Ben, uh, 28, uh, going to be uh, starting out full time at Ledger Prime June 1st. Uh, been in the institutional vol space for crypto for a little over a year and a half now. Uh, kind of, you know, cut my teeth at Genesis. Uh, Worked with Josh Lim, was the second guy on the Genesis Derivs desk there. Um, and yeah, that's kind of, you know, my brief crypto background. Um, background on myself, you know, I went to Duke, studied econ comp side, kind of always wanted to be a trader. Uh, so that's why I did econ. So you did didn't really end up learning. You did computer yeah. science and economics at Duke. That's a double major or is that a yeah, major minor? Double major, yeah. Cool, nice. And what, what did you like better, computer science or econ? Uh, comp side for sure. Like I actually went to Duke for the economics program. Uh, but like most of the stuff I learned in economics was very uh, like close end, mo like very, like you have these initial assumptions and then you build your model around it. Um, and basically that, that was it. Like it was very like hard to apply to, you know, um, like the real world, in my opinion, like we have these like microeconomics models where you have an indifference curve and you're trying to find the tangent point on the indifference curve to like, you know, do all this stuff. But like in real life, having that indifference curve and like building those models isn't really super helpful, at least from my point of view. But CompSci was really an eye opener. My dad was uh, an engineer. He kind of like told me to get some hard skills. So like yeah. to take a CompSci 101 class. So I, I begrudgingly did that like my freshman year and ended up really liking it. Um, and I just liked it because the, uh, the problems were like kind of open-ended, right? Like you have, a, you have an end goal, but how you get there is really up to you. It could be really efficient. It could be inefficient. It could be really like, you know, short and to the point. But I like that creativity and the ability to actually build something where in econ, there was really only like one way to solve like a question on a problem set, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. Like there's a lot of axioms in economics that we just assume to be true, and therefore we have to like build a model within those those boundaries. And I don't know if you've heard exactly, yeah. But like econ professors are the best traders I've ever met. <laughs> That's a joke. Sorry. Really? <laughs> no, 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 absolutely not. They're like the no worst. Way. <laughs> no, that. So yes. Okay. Cool. I love it. Hard hard skills in college from comp sci. You know, relevant soft skills from econ. I did econ myself uh, in, in school, and so. Real quick for, for people who are new to Crypto Vol. So Ben says he's got a year and a half in Crypto Vol. Crypto Vol is a pretty young space. Deribit started trading its first options in late 2016. And this is crypto, so everything moves in dog years. So one year and a half is like 13 years in regular ChadFi. So that's just for some context for everyone. So real quick, Ben, so you said you went to Duke. Where did, where did you grow up? Uh, I grew up in Long Island. So. Um in a town called Syosset, oh, uh, nice. kind of in the middle north of the island, yeah. Cool, sir. East Coast guy. Nice guy. East, East Coast guy, yeah. Guys. No, I'm just kidding. I would just mess around. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. So that's 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 great to know. So what got you into trading? Like, were you in trading before college? Or, you know, what, what was your sort of your inspiration? Or did you not know and you just decided to do econ and comp sci just from uh, this looks useful? What was the deal? Um, so, like... I guess in, in high school, I was trying to find like some direction on like what I want to do. Uh, and I don't know, like if you know, Ro Patel, you know, Roshan, uh, we were actually good friends growing up from like middle school. So me and him were always kind of like interested in markets. Uh, like he was in the investment club. He told me to join to check it out. And that was kind of where I first, uh, got like, got into trading because they had they ran the stock market game where you run your own portfolio mm. and it was really cool because it was competitive right so like pe the best pnl every week would be on like a leaderboard outside on the hall so you'd see like theoretically the best traders even though we're in high school you know we didn't really know what we're doing but we would you know kind of it, it, it kind of i liked it because of the competitive nature like you see how well you're doing it's objective it's not like someone you know grading your results um and i really like that aspect and 
uh, it was cool also during that time, uh, you know, like the 2008 financial crisis was happening and like I was a kid trying to understand, you know, what's going on, like why is everything nuking? Um, so I kind of like started to get into like macro. That's kind of why I wanted to learn econ uh, in college because uh, I thought it was really cool and it was very pertinent to like me going through the financial crisis as like a young kid and trying to understand like what exactly is going on. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of like my brief intro to trading. Yeah, that's very cool. So you started in high school, you started learning it. 2008 happens, things are going crazy. Roshan Patel, for those who don't know, he was the head of lending, I believe, at Genesis Trading, which is a big OTC desk here in the crypto vol space. Is where I first met uh, Ben myself. Um, cool. So so that's very interesting. And now. When you uh, first got into trading, did you trade stocks yourself? Like, did you do any stock trades? Do you still look at sort of these trad buy markets? Um, so like, I didn't really, so like, I guess I didn't really throw a lot of capital. Like, so like 2008 happened, I was in middle school and then I was, I started reading about economics. And then once I got to high school, you know, joined the, the, um, the, the investment club and kind of traded that. Um, Cause I didn't really have any cash as a kid and like, it was harder for my parents to like set up a brokerage account for a kid than it is, I guess, these days with all the people on Robinhood. Um, so I didn't really get to, you know, deploy my own capital. But I will say I did make some like trades when I was a kid. Um, I was really into uh, like sneakers and like sneaker drops, like SBs and Jordans. Um, you know, it was kind of very similar to the, you know, NFTs right now. Like there'd be a mint, right? Like there'd be a drop. I was scouring Twitter, waiting for the link. Uh, and so one of my like best trades when I was like in high school was I got the, uh, the easy twos when they dropped at retail. So I luckily like got, was on Twitter at the right time, got them, bought the Yeezys, flipped them, and then bought my first like MacBook with that. So that was nice. like one of my first real like deployment of my own capital into a trade kind of. Very cool. That's great. So then let's, let's fast forward. So you go to college, you do comp sci, econ. Did you do any internships uh, at trading firms or did you start working at a trading firm directly out of college? So on and so forth. Uh, yeah, so like I kind of went down the traditional uh, track. Um, so I interned at like Morgan Stanley, uh, those rotational kind of internships. Uh, I was, what was really interesting to me, actually what I wanted to do initially was options. Like they had a really sick index ball desk. Um, it was really cool like seeing, you know, them in action. Um, and the one thing that kind of happened though, was that after, by the time I got to wall street and was interning doing my junior internship, you know, a lot of the prop trading was kind of gone. A lot of the discretionary like risk taking by desk was gone and they were very much more flow driven. Uh, so like, I remember one day the, uh, the MD sat me down and was like, look, if you really want to trade and, you know, take risk, like you should check out prop trading. I didn't hear, I didn't really know what prop trading was at that time. So we named a few firms like DRW, et cetera, et cetera. So after that internship, you know, I applied to DRW uh, to like cut my teeth there kind of and follow like his, uh, his advice. Um, I also, and like that kind of led me to, you know, the world of prop trading. Uh, and so my first job out of college was at DRW um, in Singapore uh, doing like ETF market making, which is, pretty much like high frequency trading of ETFs versus like their Delta one like equivalent in futures. Cool, that's that's really interesting. And that's something we both have in common. We both spent some time at DRW, that's that's cool. I just learned that right before recording this podcast. So that, that's, a, that's a fun little com commonality. Um, so as far as your trading career goes, like, you know, trading is sort of this never ending growth endeavor. That's how I view it in a lot of ways. Is there lessons that you learned as a trader, anything that really sticks out of your mind, either like a big win or a big loss or, you know, something that that you've been learning over the years or something that you learned from someone else? Uh, I think like the biggest thing I learned, I, it, I think I learned a lot in crypto because of how much how volatile it is, and you know, how you have to like sometimes just sit on a loss, uh, even if you know it's a winning trade. I think the biggest thing is like to like turn off or stop trading when you're super on tilt. Uh, usually those are like my worst trades when like I puke reverse and like, I'm like kind of revenge trading myself. Uh, and, you know, sometimes it's good to just like step away for a sec, 
even though like you know you're nervous about price action i think that's like one of the key things especially in crypto um i guess for other trading i like things i've learned through the way like uh especially in crypto the like the like managing your collateral across exchanges you know i had to deal with like otc like collateral and then you know collateral on coinbase collateral on ftx on deribit and dealing with margining and moving collateral on pretty pretty nimbly and also kind of predicting you know like looking at like where i would kind of be in a danger zone and having to like anticipate uh, the efficient use of our capital uh, because unlike in traditional finance you know you don't have cross margining you don't have like a mm. clearing house and pb and so that's kind of a thing that even like maybe trap five people don't really kind of take for granted that like whole efficiency of collateral management yeah that's a, that's a really good point and so i think it's one of those things that uh sam bankman freed like one of his big edges was being able to figure that out to, to collect arbs and get collateral between different places uh super interesting so now fast forwarding to sort of the present day here you are you're at ledger prime you're on their otc derivatives desks um, what would you say like your main function is? Is it like a market maker or is it like a pure prop trader or like, w you know, what kind of realm does it fall into? Yeah, so I have a pretty wide mandate. So as a like, I, I'm technically a portfolio manager. So, you know, I deal with OTC flow um, is one big aspect, you know, dealing with clients, um, facilitating trade, kind of flow trading. Um, we're also a big market maker on Deribit, uh, like screen and on paradigm RFQs as well. So that's like a mix of algorithmic and then, you know, kind of human touch on like the bigger clip sizes. Uh, and a lot of it, I would say is like, sometimes you still need to be prop, even though you're being a market maker, right? I still have a view. I still have like a tilt, um, and it shows in my quotes or it'll show in my hedges, right? I'll use like passive flow. Uh, and collect that bid offer and use it to subsidize, you know, uh, hedges or like prop spreads that I want to be into, be like uh, positioned into. So a lot of vol trading for me is very like position, like positional and like putting yourself in the best position uh, given like the expected outcomes um, rather than just being like, okay, I, I got something OTC. I'm going to hedge it one-to-one -one on Deribit and like make a small R. Because usually that's not really feasible for like the bigger sizes um, or it's just not that profitable either. Yeah, that makes sense. And sometimes there's some things that are just like real opportunities that we see in the market. I remember, I think it was about last year when ETH finally broke above 3000 for the first time. Um, I saw this trade where it's like realized vol was a, you know so much higher than implied vol by like 30 points, something like that. And um, I was tweeting about it and you reached out to me and you're like, hey man, I, I really like this trade. This is something that I've been looking at too. Uh, and it ended up being just like this huge winner and implied vol was just mispriced and, and caught up finally. And, and so if you're doing like little small scalps and ARPs like that, you're going to miss sort of these big opportunities that exist in the space. Um, so in your experience from looking at TradFi versus CryptoVol or TradFi Vol versus CryptoVol, what kind of like, um, like things do you notice? I mean, obviously the space is maturing, but do you ever see like things that are clear mispricing or these types of trades that come up over and over again without explain without giving away edge is that something that you know you guys look for or is it more unique unique individual opportunities yeah i would say like one thing about crypto is like if something looks like it's an arb you really have to like dig in to make sure like you understand why things are mispriced in a certain way like a good example is you know the call wing like the 25 delta call wing probably in big Bitcoin and ETH, regardless of the tenors, you know, like the 25 Delta option is trading under, in IV terms, under the at the monies. And that's something you don't really see in TradFi. Like there's usually skew on both sides, even a marginal skew. But this, this is actually saying like the IV premium is at a discount for these 25 Delta calls. So you could go, so like one, you could sit there and be like, hmm, maybe these wingy calls are mispriced. Or two, you could really sit down and kind of think about like, why is it so like it's been like that for like a month or two now mm -hmm. um and it's basically from my understanding is that there's a lot of upside call sellers um you know there's constant you know put demand there's not really a strong bid for any of these calls there's miners hedging calls there's a lot of you know people doing structured product kind of flows doing covered calls um and so that's continuously depressing that like call wing and even though you could think it's cheap it could stay like that for a while and so those are the kind of things where you have to sit down and think about like 
why is this like lasting and like is this really worth fading or is this going to like continue to be like that and i just have to accept you know the reality of the market right now because crypto is still in a state where it's like not small but it's small enough that like big flows can really push markets and make you know term structure or skew you know be the way they are and have kinks and act weirdly yeah that's a great point that's a uh, it's like understanding you know why this this thing exists and then deciding if you want to fade it or not fade it instead of just looking at the chart something for you know people who are new to crypto vol space you know underpriced call call wings are kind of a new phenomenon the past couple of years call wings have been typically a lot more expensive than equidistant put wings so that's a that's a new interesting sort of trend that we're seeing um cool very nice so as far as your own trading career goes um let's say you're someone who's new you know getting into trading maybe getting into crypto vol especially as these markets develop and more venues come online and and maybe one day Darebit, you know has a u.s presence as well which would be great um what would you say to someone who wants to learn about crypto, crypto vol, vol in general, and start getting into this business? Is there books that you recommend they read, or what, what, where would you recommend these people to start? Um, so for vol in general, like crypto vol, regardless, I, I like I still refer back to like two main books. Um, one is the Option Volatility and Pricing by uh, Sheldon Nadenberg. That one is like the Bible, the Green Book. Mm-hmm. Um, I got that as an intern at DRW. Uh, I did a brief internship there and they like had us read that and do quizzes on it and like learn the ins and outs of it. So I still have that book from, you know, when I was intern there as well. And that that's a really handy tool because it's more of a high level intuitive understanding of options rather than maybe like a a whole book where it's very mathy and you kind of get lost in the sauce and then you don't really know what's going on because it's so dense. Right. Sometimes you kind of have to like zoom out and have like a holistic, intuitive understanding of options. And some of the best option traders I met at like DRW and stuff, they they weren't math, very mathy, but they had a very good under, intuitive understanding of like the different like second order effects of their positions and these spreads and like how it affects their entire portfolio. Um, so I would say like that book and then the, uh, the dynamic hedging book by Taleb, even though I know some people have some qualms with Taleb. Um, that book is still pretty good um, and has a lot of good insights as well. Yeah, totally. And actually, um, so real quick, moving backwards a little bit. So Taleb, um, and it, correct me if I have this story wrong, but if I'm remembering it correctly, how he made his uh, his name in the vol space is that for the longest time, we had flat put skews. And Taleb was saying, you know, these flat put skews don't make sense. If, if the markets get down here, Vol should be higher, like it'll take vol to get the market down here, so to speak, different vol environments. So he's buying these tails, these put tails, at pretty much flat vol, and then we had the uh, October 87 crash, and then he just made a boatload of money with that that, fa- that flat put skew. Is, it, is that the, uh, the story that you remember as well? I believe so, and it's pretty crazy if, um, because after that, you know, S&P like puts like skews always kind of jacked now. Everyone's always worried about like the 1987 crash. So that kind of changed the whole like TradFi environment for like skew on options basically too. So yeah, super interesting. Kind of legendary. Yeah, yeah legendary for sure. So that that's really cool. Super interesting stuff. And then on the DRW side, you know, DRW has this really cool options course that all the new people go through. Um, so the book that you read and they give you quizzes and all this stuff, very, very tough uh, or like thorough uh, introduction to options. Cool. OK, so as far as like the industry of crypto vol, where do you see it going? Like what kind of uh, sectors are you most excited by? Is it like DeFi options or, you know, growing volumes on Deribit or growing volumes on OTC desks or maybe, you know, CME, Bitcoin options, things like that? Um, I think for me, you know, one of the most interesting parts of the business that's growing and like that I'm personally kind of very interested in is like the altcoin vault space, whether it be like DeFi, like uh, like vaults or even like, um, you know, centralized exchanges like Deribit just listed Solana, right? You know, Bit.com came out with BCH a little bit ago. That was the first real like centralized alt vault. Um, so having a growing market for a bunch of different tickers because, uh, you know, trading vol on a bunch of diff- these different assets is really fun, especially when it's over 100 vol. It gets pretty crazy, gets pretty wild. 
um, and you see some crazy like you know movement. Um, and there's a lot of opportunity there. So I think the alt ball space in general, which you know there's a good, it's pretty big, but it's like OTC mainly, and giving a more generalized access to everyone via centralized exchanges or auctions, um, as we're seeing with the vaults, is going to be awesome. I also think you know the like Zeta, for instance, on Solana, having like a centralized limit order book for um, options as well is awesome is because it gives like, you know, people the ability to, you know, express views. I know a lot of people that want to, you know, hedge their portfolio or just like meet calls on these altcoins. Um, and I, I think for the, even for the DJs that want to like, you know, just, you know, have that convex upside, it might actually be better for them to like use options because there's like a fixed downside if they're buying options or they can just lose a premium than like going 10 X leverage on FTX mm-hmm. and, you know, getting liquidated. Right. Like they can get like, you know, pretty good leverage, but with like fixed downside. Uh, and hopefully they can use that as like a risk mitigation tool as well. But I think the whole space for me is like growing exponentially. The altcoin space is what I'm most excited for, but even like the growing volumes, right? On Paradigm, on Deribit, you're seeing quotes be tighter. On Paradigm, like you won't win a trade unless you're like slightly inside markets for like, you know, min lot sizes. Uh, so things are definitely getting tighter. And, um, yeah, it's, it's just evolving space. It's crazy. Yeah, that's that's super interesting. The uh, altcoin volatility space. So do you guys make markets on, on that as well? Does the uh, Ledger Prime OTC desk do quotes for altcoin vol? Yeah, we do. We, we'll make markets basically on most altcoins um, as long as there's some way for us to have a liquid delta hedge. Um, it's basically like the only requirement. But yeah, we'll make markets on most. That's great. That's really interesting. And then... How about the DeFi space? Like you mentioned Zeta, you mentioned these DOVs, DeFi option vaults for those who, who don't know what that is. Um, then then there's also, you know, option AMMs. What do you think about those? Have you looked into those? Um, I've kind of looked into them. Uh, I'm like 50-50 on them. I kind of still have like this fixed trap fight mindset that there should be an order book, right? Because like, uh, especially for people that are, on the other side in the AMM, like you kind of want to know what options you're selling, right? Like uh, so, there's sometimes that I don't want to be exposed to some flow or I do want to be exposed to flow. And uh, I feel like the AMM model is much different than like trading spot, right? Uh, and for that reason, like there's so many different contracts, like or what, are you going to have like an AMM pool for each contract or is this the AMM pool going to be exposed to like a Delta range? Um, there are a lot of like questions on like how exactly you should kind of implement it. Um, but yeah, I, I guess that's my personal thoughts, but sure. I mean, you never know. It could, it could become like the next thing. Yeah, totally. Awesome. And so if someone wants to, uh, get in touch with Ledger Prime, is there like a website they can go to or anything like that to get in touch with someone over there? Yeah, you can go to ledgerprime.com and at the bottom, there should be an email info at ledgerprime.com. Uh, and send inquiries there and then we can reach out to you via email or you know connect via telegram and whatnot cool awesome and then just some just for some nice like uh kind of easier fun questions at the end here trading is a pretty like you know non-stop career choice i mean it's really a 24 7 you know even when you're sleeping you get calls in the middle of the night just how it goes how do you find you know balance in in your regular life going to do other things and having fun getting rest, so on and so forth? Uh, yeah, that's a tough question. I, I guess like the main thing is like to never have like a position on where you really can't sleep or step away from the screens. Uh, but for me, you know, to unwind, um, I'll like, I, I kind of lift a good amount now. Like I've been focusing on, just, you know, holistically, like, you know, bear markets are kind of for health now. Um, nice. It's a good coping mechanism. <laughs> but yeah, lifting, um, Miami's always nice. It's always nice weather out. So going out, out on walks, you know, going to like the rooftop pools is always nice. Um, and then I'm kind of a big gamer. So been gaming to take the stress away. Good way to like decompress. Yeah. Cool. What, what kind of games? Uh, I mainly play like shooters and like RTS games. Uh, so I've just been dabbling on whatever I see on steam. Uh, oh, nice. It used to be big on. Yeah. That's great. RTS is real time strategy. Or is that what it is? Real-time strategy, yeah. Oh, cool. That's like Command & Conquer and Red Alert and stuff? Yeah, Command & Conquer, like StarCraft kind of stuff. Nice. Um, Yeah, those are fun. I I I play a lot of Civilization, too. Civilization's fun. That's awesome. That's great. 
And then uh, lastly, do you have like any, what are sort of your goals? Like where do you see, you know, personal growth? Where, where, where are you aiming the next sort of stage of personal growth? And what is it something that you're focused on? Um, I guess for me, like personal growth, like we're building a lot of systems internally. Um, so working with the devs, uh, trying to, you know, also stay a little disciplined, especially during these markets, like, like either personally disciplined with your, you know, your habits and whatnot, and like your, your schedule, but also like with, uh, you know, taking risk as well. Right. Like if you have a stop out limit or you have a take profit, you know, kind of, you know, don't try to shoot for the stars, especially with how choppy things are. So for me, like personal growth is just focusing on like absolute discipline in like all aspects of life, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, also kind of, I guess like career wise, you know, just try to increase volumes, increase market share, um, and just seek out edge wherever I can. Well, Ben, thank you so much for, for your time. We really appreciate listening to your insights and your career path. For everyone listening, thanks again for tuning in. Remember, find edge, capture alpha, and slang size. Cool. Thank you so much, Ben. This was awesome. We'll stop recording it.